Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames finally lost a game. We thought it might never happen. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to discuss, Matt, the monumental loss and what could be a bigger monumental trade on the docket this week. So let's start by talking about this week and what we thought, shall we? Yeah, well, you know, it it took a big effort for the Flames to lose. Like, they shot the opponent in, like, 40 to 20, and in overtime, two players were kind of interfered and tripped on the play to allow the winning goal, so... You know, it took quite a, an effort to, for the Flames to lose a game. Even before we get into the games this week, um, for la- we're now in uh, the first part of November, November 3rd, so we should probably just kind of start saying that Jacob Markstrom was named the NHL's first star of the week last week, and that was partly because of his efforts in the first two games here. So the Flames ended off their road trip in Pittsburgh, playing against the Penguins, and ended up with a big win here, a 4 nothing win. Goals from Goudreau. Coleman, Dubé, and Lucic to get the Flames that win. What were your thoughts on this uh, game? Pittsburgh is always a team that, like, I've always felt that their secondary players have always been a little unheralded. Because, like, everybody looks at Crosby and Malkin, and, like, clearly, like, those guys are amazing. But the depth guys also can bring their game. And, like, Toronto the other day, uh, just prior to Calgary facing the Penguins, got obliterated uh, seven nothing by Pittsburgh, and like Calgary needed to keep on their toes in this game uh, because of the relentlessness of the Penguins, and like Calgary did get out to the early one nothing lead with uh, Gaudreau firing a nice wrist shot into the top corner, but uh, it you know Calgary then just kind of held on and kind of let the Penguins punch themselves out a bit and, like, kept everything to the outside. Markstrom, I didn't feel, was overly, overly tested. Sometimes, yes, but, like, most, like even though he was making a large number of saves, it wasn't as bad as, like, a 40-shot-against <laughs> performance. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on part of that. I think the Flames didn't play their best game, but they I thought they were very opportunistic. Yeah, and I, that yeah, was, I agree. And that was what I took away from yeah, it. Yeah, and how would you say that the Flames, uh, it seems, are learning to manage games a little more um, and, like, not panic, like, when Pittsburgh is pouring it on. Well, they're not scoring, so just hold the line, basically. And not be like, oh, we're, you know, getting out shot by, like, this huge amount. And just focusing on doing the methodical things that they needed to do. And then they capitalized, and then the Penguins just fell apart for a few minutes. And they popped another couple in, and by that time, it's good night, And <laughs> just gotta wait for the clock to end. It sort of felt like the opposite opposite of what the flames usually get it's usually the flames that sort of run out of gas and fall apart well that that's why i think uh sutter emphasized conditioning uh, this off season uh more so than normal um because in order to play sutter's game you need to have that motor being able to go throughout the game and you have to be able to be flexible to react to what's being presented to you from the other team and like in the next game the flyers kind of were listless for the first 40 minutes and the flames just kind of took over from that point but uh, you know it's one of those things that you know being able to be consistent in what you're doing despite whatever the opponent's doing and keeping the opponent having to work outwork you basically which and make that as much of a difficult task in order to get any scoring opportunities and then you get to face Markstrom at the end of it Michael Stone was in the lineup for his first game of the season in this one he was in for Noah Hannafin who was out and I thought that you know as we've said a lot of times when uh, Stone is in the lineup he looks good and he looked good here and an interesting note when do you think the last time that the Flames swept a uh swept a, a series of five or more games was 
I have no idea, but it's been a while. De- December yeah. 07. Uh, another interesting fact, the Flames did not trail once on that road trip. That was only the third time in NHL history that a team has uh, played in five road games and not or more and not trailed for a second of any of them. You know, I don't want to... I mean, they don't give out Stanley Cups for October hockey, but you and I have talked about how we thought the Flames might be second to Vegas this year, and we'll talk about Vegas when we get to Jack Eichel, but Vegas is starting to fall quickly. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if Calgary might be able to pick up some of that slack and maybe win the Pacific if if Vegas continues to fall because of some of the injuries. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see, like especially with the Eichel situation, um, because of the fact that you look at the teams in the Pacific Division and most of them are bad except for Calgary and Edmonton. And Edmonton has had a little bit of the benefit of playing a lot of mediocre teams to start, so... It'll be interesting to see as uh, the season progresses if the Flames can actually start to build some separation between them and everybody else. Well, to talk about some of that separation, let's finish up this week. The Flames came home after their lengthy road trip, and they took on the Philadelphia Flyers and again got a 4 nothing win over the Flyers. Uh, Markstrom got his third shutout and four starts, the first Flames goalie to ever do that, as the Flames got goals his first of the year from Monaghan, his third of the year from Kachuk, second of the year from Backlund, second of the year from Goudreau. What were your thoughts on this uh, one, Matt? I think that the Flames, you know, you look at the Flyers coming in, they, like they had the fifth, best offense in the NHL, very high-flying team, and boy, did the Flames just run all over them. Like, it it was a a no-doubter, like, right from the opening face-off through the whole game. Like, Calgary just completely controlled everything. It felt like that right from the opening face-off, didn't it? It just felt like Calgary wanted this one and kept their foot on the gas the whole time. Yeah, it, it... you know, to equivalent, it would be like a Stanley Cup contender playing like the worst team in the league. That's basically like how the game felt, where, you know, like it was just <laughs> very disparate effort levels and results from the two teams. Yeah, I don't think there's much else to say here. This was uh, quite a show by the Calgary yeah. Flames. Uh, one of their best performances, frankly, since, well, the last 15 years like it was just utter domination like i can hardly think of any other games that spring to mind where it was just you know steamrolling an opponent like that it was a fun one to watch for the cr red for sure and then the last game uh we're recording this on wednesday as always the last game was tuesday night the calgary flames win streak comes to an end um, and I guess their point, well, their point streak doesn't, but their win streak does. The Calgary Flames lose in overtime 3-2 to two to the Nashville Predators. The goals from the Flames come from Kachuk, and Shillington gets his first And you year. see with that Maybe goal, that you can. could see why I thought he might make a good forward. That release was... I was about to say, and now Matt's going to say that the man should be a forward because he's scoring goals. Well, that release was just mint there, so uh, hopefully he can keep that kind of thing up. Like, how fast he actually got from the blue line into where he actually scored. Like, the, the defender didn't even have opportunity to get his stick in the way. Like, it was already in the net by the time he actually put his stick out in front. And, like, that, you know, his speed and offensive instincts, like, if he can keep up with the good quality defense, that it, that offensive instinct will make him a very good player for the Flames. He really, he's the, I'd say the only player that you're really seeing huge growth from so far. Oh yeah. Like it's not the same player. Like th- this is basically like uh, the year that TJ Brody broke out. But I think with even better offensive instincts than Br- what Brody had, where he just is very good defensively, very impactful and noticeable offensively. And is just doing everything at a top tier level, which you know, if this is what Oliver Shillington is, like, this is a top-pairing level defenseman. And, you know, yeah, it's only been a handful of games, but, you know, if this is what we're going to get from him, like, that's a huge, huge thing for this team. I agree. I totally agree. 
Yeah, I don't have much else. I, I, I want to be careful how I approach this game. I don't want to complain about officiating, but I think this is probably the first time that the Flames have maybe faced some adversity in a game, and I think it's going to be interesting to see what the bounce back looks like against Dallas because of it. Oh, for sure. And, like, I think, like, if the Flames play this game, like, a hundred times, they probably win 95 of them. It's just that they didn't quite get the bounces that they needed. Soros played an absolutely stellar game and deserved to be the first star of the game. Like, he was amazing in net for Nashville. And, you know, they were opportunistic when they needed to be. And, you know, that one play in overtime was a bit chintzy, but, you know, uh, things like that do happen, and you can't bank on the referees actually calling things in overtime. Like, even though, you know, certain things are, you know, you would assume would be automatic, you know, that's not necessarily going to be called. And, you know, Kachuk, frankly, needed to be a little bit more hustle in his game to get back into the play, which you just didn't see. And, yeah, it, it happens. And, you know, getting a point, that to me is the important part. Like, if you're going to lose, at least get a point out of it. Yeah, they lost. They got a point out of it. Like you said, I mean, it's, it keeps the point streak alive. And they, I thought the Flames, I don't know what you thought, but I thought the Flames played right up until the end. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those things. It was like the Anaheim uh, overtime loss where just one bad play it, it resulted in the goal against an overtime. And just in this one, like, it was just one little series of bad plays happened and game over, but, like, the rest of the game up until that point in each of those games was just a top-notch game from the Flames. And, you know, it, it's... If you're playing like that consistently, like, you're not going to win... 82 games in a season you're going to lose but you know you're gonna be making teams have to be opportunistic and you know fluky at times their way to wins and you know where you're completely outworking the other team well with those wins the calgary flames are now tied for first in the pacific tied with the dastardly edmonton oilers at 14 points we've played nine games won six lost one uh, two overtime losses for a total of 14 points. Matt, when was the last time you can remember in October where w our record was 6-1-2? One, and two? Well, 6-1-1 one, and because one, that game was in November. So Oh, that's true. Usually it's so, like 1-6, and six, not 6-1. Six and one. I know. It's like, uh, where am I? Which team is this? Huh? This makes no sense. I think you pretty much have to go all the way back to that uh, season where Roman Turek got his good contract. You have to go back the to the flame... year before October was invented. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> back... Yeah, that, that's basically it. <laughs> like, back yeah. when the season started in November. Yes. <laughs> um yeah, no, it's, I know. I mean, it's it's crazy to see this, right? And I don't want to, like I said, you know, the Stanley Cup's not awarded for play in October, but it's promising. Well, and you see, like, uh, at the beginning or at, at the end of the training camp, uh, Conroy, I remember being interviewed and, like, kind of complaining about a little bit of disconnect uh, between Sutter's way of handling the training camp and what management wanted where, like, more involvement from the prospects, and Sutter's like, no, we kind of want to start the season on time, and was placing more emphasis. You're seeing the results of what Sutter did. You like, are. And, yeah. and I think that, like, that's part of the reason why the Flames continually have bad Octobers is because they're having to learn how to actually play with each other properly in the season instead of in training camp like every other team. And... You know, like there are prospect games and, you know, farm teams that you can use to evaluate players. You know, you do not need to screw your entire season because, oh, let's have prospects play. You know, like the Flames would have made the playoffs last year. Hmm. <laughs> you know, that kind no, of I, thing. I totally, I totally agree with you. And I guess the big question there, every year we see some team that starts hot and, you know, craps the bed by December. And, you know, is that going to be our Flames? No, Daryl won't sure allow won't. it. Daryl won't allow that. Like, we haven't seen Daryl mad yet. <laughs> Daryl, when he gets mad, yeah, 
it's not going to be fun for the Flames to play. So, you know, they're going to not want to, like, bring out the Hulk there. So <laughs> I remember when I was a kid and our coach would get mad at us. He'd make us do conditioning training. When Daryl gets too mad, he's going to make these guys, like, you know, um, go out and till his fields with just a, a hand shovel. Muck out the pig stalls. <laughs> That's right. Instead, instead of doing a, instead of doing a uh, like conditioning, you know, practice, you're gonna have to go to Daryl's Daryl's farm and clean the clean the barn with your bare hands. <laughs> yep. You you boys better put in an effort. Or you're coming to the farm tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep, boss. Okay. That's why Shillington's just out there blazing it up. He's going. I'm not gonna be the one making us clean the N- nope. Clean the barn. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not me, nope. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, we, we haven't seen uh, Daryl go all, all farmer on him yet. <laughs> well, Matt, with that, I guess uh, let's talk about the main event. And the main event is, I guess, it, it's been a topic for about six months, but uh, the, the news came out last night that the, I guess, the Jack Eichel deal is, is as it was said, at the one-yard line with the Calgary Flames and the Las Vegas Golden Knights being the final two suitors in the deal. Uh, we've heard the Flames involved for a while, but I thought let's finally talk about some of the rumors that are out there and some pros and cons of this Jack Eichel deal and our thoughts on it. So uh, today we saw from Kevin Weeks the rumor that uh, his understanding is the Flames have offered Kachuk an upcoming first rounder, a former first rounder, and two prospects for Jack Eichel. What are your thoughts on that, Matt? Um... From the Flames' point of view, um, why hasn't this been done? <laughs> well, and, and that's the question, right? Like, if that's the package, what are we waiting on? And is Buffalo, what else is Buffalo expecting? You know, like, yeah, Eichel's great and all that, but, like, there has to also be some realism there, and, like, the Flames are giving a lot if that's the. You know, like, and especially, like, say Kachuk doesn't want to stay in Buffalo. You can get almost a similar package that you get for Eichel for Kachuk from another team. So, like, you can walk away with a whole crap ton of assets to make your team better. Like, it, it, you you think back to, uh, like, when the Flyers uh, traded for Eric Lindros, right? And, yeah, the Flyers got Eric Lindros, but, like, they gave up Peter Forsberg and, like, a whole bunch of other parts that ended up basically fueling them getting Patrick Waugh down the road and, you know, a bunch of other key pieces when they won the Stanley Cup in 95-96 with the Avalanche. And, you know, like, Buffalo, if they play their cards right, they can flip assets out and like get like a whole bunch of really good prospects in and turn their team over relatively quickly and become a powerhouse themselves instead of you know trying to you know finagle like an extra second round pick or some other thing which is not real really realistic and especially when you're also when you're uh mentioning Vegas being the other suitor, all Vegas really has is prospects because most of their NHL guys are hurt right now. So it's kind of like... But that uh, was the original rumor is that Buffalo wanted futures and Vegas has better futures than Calgary does. Debatable. I think maybe not prospect guys, but I would say they even have a younger NHL talent base that you could draw upon. True. But it's... Like, how would you say the difference between the two is not monumental? Like, it's not like you're, say, like, trading with the Rangers and you're going to get Lafreniere in the deal. Or, you know, like, a, a top, top, top tier guy. You're not, like, that's not what this deal's about. So it's, like, yeah, like, is uh, Peyton Krebs better than Connor Zari? Yes, by mountains of difference? No. So it's kind of like... Like, the difference between the two might be a third-round pick, if that. So it's like... You know, and Calgary has, like... Like, if they're including Kachuk or Monaghan, who've also heard might be involved, like, they're getting, like, actual roster player capital, which they can use to get additional assets from another team. 
Well, let's break so, this down a little bit, okay? So if the if the Flames are trading Kachuk, if it was the deal that Kevin Weeks proposed, let's assume that former first round pick is Valimaki, safe to say? Yeah, I would pretty much guarantee that. And then they're saying two prospects. So let's assume maybe a guy like uh, maybe one who's not on the roster. So I'd say either Zari or Peltier. I would assume that. And you're going to need to give up an NHL deal to make the money work because you yeah. got to free up ten million. And so like I'd, say- I'd, I'd, just for sake of clarity, like the two prospects, go with say uh, Jeremy Poirier and Connor Zari, just because like first and third round pick. See, and I can't even see that. I can see one of those guys, but I think the other one's going to have to be a guy like Dubé to free up some NHL money. Yeah. Well, like, that's where I can see, like, the Flames tossing in a depth player or something. Um, if you, well, if you move Kachuk, you're getting, what, $7 million off Well, the, the books. thing is, is that, like, uh, uh, strangely as it sounds, Nikita Zadorov might be a viable component because you can remove his $4 million. And yeah, Buffalo but I don't then... know that Buffalo wants to rent him from us at this point. Well, again, you can flip him at the deadline for a second or something. Or I think if and... you want to do that, you almost wave him at this point, send him down, and claim some cash that way. Yeah, it's one of those where it depends on... But let's, much... let's just go by what Weeks said. So Weeks is saying that we got uh, Kachuk in the deal, which frees up what? about Because we have a million dollars available right now. So yeah, seven, uh, seven plus a million is eight. Plus uh, what's uh, Valen Val- Mackey worth? Uh, around a, a million. Yeah. So, so nine and a half. Yeah. So at that point, yeah, we can probably find a way to free up another half million, even if it's, you know, waving somebody for a couple days or something like that. Yeah. Like, that's relatively easy. Like, even if you're... Uh, like uh, throwing one of the like million dollar cap hit guys on the farm, you know, like that would be enough. Well, and those guys don't count under the cap, though, right? Uh, they oh, do. do. That's right. Yeah, if they're over a million bucks, they do. Yeah, they'll figure something out. Yeah, because you you get to lose nine hundred thousand of it, so like it would be close enough where, yeah. So I guess if we're giving up Kachuk, and to me. If the Flames are giving up Kachuk, they have to know at this point he's not signing. Yeah. Like, I don't think, I don't know what you think, but I think if the Flames are at the point where they're moving Kachuk, they've talked to his agent and they're saying he's not signing. If he's going to stay here, you keep Kachuk. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like, realistically, so he, like, you know, like if you're going to trade one of the main group, so to speak, Monaghan would be like the more obvious because center for center. Well, let's come back thing. to Monaghan. Let's talk about kind of the big but, name first. You know, if you don't so, mind. like, if well, that's what I'm getting at. Like, if you're dealing Kachuk in this deal, there's a reason why, in a similar manner that Adam Fox, yeah, was not here. Exactly. Yeah, because to me, I would rather have Kachuk long term because you know what you've got, and this is my worry with. Uh, with Eichel is we don't quite know what we've got there. We don't know how the surgery's going to turn out. So if you've got the chance to have Kachuk long-term or Eichel right now, especially with the team hot, I think you have to bet on the sure bet. Yeah. Um, but you're right. If, if you can trade, I think the original package has always been Monaghan. And with Monaghan now in the bottom six, what a fantastic deal. Yeah. So if you bring in, if you bring in Eichel for, I mean, your, your preference would probably be Monaghan, right, over Kachuk? Yeah. It just... Positionally, that makes more sense. You're going to have to give up another NHL guy, I think, with Monaghan. Who would you throw in there? Um, Again, the easiest person to toss out would probably be Zadorov, just due to... Or you could ask Buffalo to eat a little bit of Eichel's contract. Is Mangiapane untouchable? I w- put it this way, I would be absolutely angry at the team if they traded Mangiapane one for one for Eichel at this point. What if it was say Monahan and Mangiapane? I uh, I would be I wouldn't trade Mangiapane one for one for Eichel right now. So I think if you're going to throw something in it's uh, not going to uh, be By the way, the reason off. for that is dollars only. <laughs> uh like Eichel is the better player than Mangiapane. I'm not saying that, but you know, Mangiapane also makes like two million dollars versus Eichel's ten, and like For that's sure. that's a huge other component. Um, so like I'm counting cap space in that, so that's where like 
to me, Manjapani is actually more valuable than what Eichel is just due to that, even though Eichel is a, a better player. I agree. I don't think you can get away with sending them Zadorov. What if the package was Monaghan, Dubé, Valimaki, and a prospect? Fine. Put it this way, as long as none of Hannafin, Anderson, or Shillington on the blue line, um, Gaudreau, Lindholm, um, Manjapane, and that's it up front, and uh, Coronado for the prospect base, that's basically the only players that I'd say are, you don't touch them. Everybody else, like, even if they wanted Wolf for some reason, which they have a bunch of goaltenders themselves, so I don't see that being a point, but if they wanted that, fine. I think right now, and I didn't think I'd say this, trading Monaghan isn't going to hurt that much with him playing bottom six. Like, if he was still our 1-2 center and you're trading him for a guy who won't be back till after the Olympics, that's a heck of a gamble. Yeah. Well, and you see, like, that's where, like, I don't see Dubé getting traded either. And it's just because of the fact, like, you've been seeing him being used as a center as well. And, it, like, if you can have Dubé being, like, your de facto second, third line center, then, like, that makes everything better until Eichel's back, and then you can shift Dubé back to the wing. And, you know... Yeah, I think you might have to give him up, though, if you're giving up Monaghan. I know, and that's where, like, I can see... Like, how would you say, if we trade Kachuk, then, like, realistically, what you'll see is Monaghan going up to line one with Gaudreau and Lindholm, and, you know... Well, and that's an the, interesting thing. So, if, if Monaghan goes up there, does Lindholm go to right, or does Monaghan go to right? Probably Lindholm, but it it's one of those... Or do you try Japani on the right of that line? Yeah, that's... I, I don't... It, that's one of those where... It, I think you'd probably see the Flames try out both situations and see which makes more sense on like the ice me, at the time. It, it To me, it feels like you're losing more in this lineup right now just because of the time delay between acquiring Eichel, if it happens, and him being active, if you get rid of Kachuk. Like, again, it feels like Monaghan, we can make do by finding a third-line center or, I mean, even putting Trevor Lewis into the lineup, at, you know, at center or something like that. Yeah, or Richardson coming in. Yeah, Richardson. But it feels like if we lose Kachuk and we're going, you know, three months without a top-line winger, we're back to where we were last year. Yeah, and... Like, that's where, like, that's why I would assume Monaghan would go up to the first line center and, let, like, put Lindholm on the wing. That would probably be my instinct. So that way you're kind of not losing that winger. Like, Monaghan's not as good as Lindholm, but it, yeah, he's not bad either. So it's one of those where... Like, to me, if we lose Monaghan, I'm comfortable for a couple months with Backlund as number two. Mm-hmm. I'd be okay with Lindholm, Backlund, let's call it Dubé and Richardson on center. Not yeah. super comfortable knowing the return that's coming, maybe. Yeah. But if, yeah, like if, that, how would you say that would be adequate entirely? Like the, the, you, you know that Eichel's coming back, so you go, okay, yeah, sure. You can put up with that for a couple months, and you know, wait till the Olympics, and then you get your number one center back, and then you know the lineup shifts accordingly. Yeah, and but it, it just feels like if we lose Kachuk, I mean, I don't know that they want to put Lindholm back in the wing. I think you almost have to go Lindholm first-line center, Monaghan second-line center, move Mangiapane to the first first line. Yeah. I mean, maybe Coleman, maybe you break up the coleman backland line. I wouldn't, but I think those are your only two options. Like, it, it's tough. I think that primarily just for ease of use um, and the fact that Lindholm and Monaghan kind of, like, they, they've shown that they can play together on that line for a number of seasons prior to uh, last year, um, that, you know, it it could be, like, how do you say, like, Dubé and Manjapane have a pretty good chemistry, Coleman uh, with Pitlick and uh, Backlund, like, that seems like a really top-tier line. Like, I don't know, like, how much more you want to be 
fiddling with things. And, like, uh, I don't know if you want to ruin the chemistry of two other lines just to make a third line be, you know, like, a, as it is in terms of how they're lined up. So it, it'll it be interesting to see. Like, it's just, it'll be tough. It's just... So yeah, if, like, either way, like, if the Flames actually do get Eichel, like, it's going to be a little bit on the tougher side for the three months, four months, until... But they've I, still got to make sure they have a serviceable enough roster to, you know, get by, because you can't wait till after the Olympic break for your savior to come. No, and that's where uh, the Flames have the benefit of playing in a terrible division, one, and two, uh, for most of this month and next month, they're playing Eastern Conference teams or teams in the Central, which don't really impact them nearly as much. And like even January, it's a lot more um, like non-divisional games. So like the Flames aren't really getting through the meat of like playing their division uh, until late in the season. And so, like, Calgary has more of an opportunity to hold their own uh, without, like, really, like, giving games to Edmonton or Vegas until significantly later. And by then, hopefully Eichel's ready and then problem solved. Do you feel like Valimaki maybe is a little more... Um, I don't want to say disposable, but maybe a little more, you're a little more open to moving them after seeing what Shillington's been doing? Well, it's one of those that you have to give to get. And, like, do I think that Valimaki is a top four defenseman in the making? Yes. Do I think that he has top pairing upside? Yes. Do the Flames have three of those guys already? Yes. So it's kind of like, take the lesser of and move him and, you know, like, I, I would not want to see Shillington or Anderson or Hannafin moved at this point. No, me neither. And, you know. So let's, we talked about where, um, wh what you might see if Kachuk moves. But let's talk about then, let's assume with each guy when, um, when, if they make the deal and Eichel's healthy, what does your first line look like at that point? Is it Goudreau, Eichel, and whoever they find on the right? I, I would assume Lindholm. Or Manjapane. And then your second line. See, I'd almost. I think you got to leave Lindholm at center then, unless. Well, I guess you could have Monahan there, but well, I think if you've got. Uh, like, I think um, if you broke it down that way, um, like Goudreau with Eichel and Manjapane might be a good first line, then Lindholm with Monahan and Dubé, and then the backland Kachuk Pitlick line. You know, as we're talking this through, Matt, it almost feels like if the deal or, happens with Kachuk, yeah. you almost need to immediately go and deal Monaghan for a winger. You could. Like, just looking at kind of the weaknesses on the roster going forward, it almost feels like you've got to recoup that winger somehow. Um, centers are more valuable long-term and short-term, so I... I'd Shoehorn but you're also going to have to shed some salary at some point to oh, take yeah, that on well, and re-sign well, guys. Well, and that's the thing, like... In the off season, yeah, sure, but for now, nah, <laughs> let it rip and you know trade Monahan in the off season if that's the case. If if Monahan is the guy that goes, I think then you probably keep uh, Johnny. I would say Eichel and Kachuk is your first line. Uh, Kachuk, it's not here. Well, I'm saying if Monahan gets oh. if Monahan gets dealt. I got so you. Monahan gets dealt, I think, it's Johnny. I yeah. think you've got to take Elias yeah. out of line one at that point. Yeah. Uh, and and Eli I'd put Lindholm with Dubé and um, Eat Bread on line two. See, I would almost go, at that point, Monahan, Mangiapani, and Lindholm. And well, Monahan some... would be gone. Oh, that's true. Yeah, you're yeah. right. So, yeah, you'd have to have Lindholm, Mangiapani, and Dubé. somebody. Dubé, I would assume, just because next yeah. on the depth chart <laughs> exactly that's that's kind of your your only option there and, and i'm more comfortable like we ha we have a lot like you said defensemen and we have a lot of centers right now serviceable centers i'm more like i'm more comfortable giving up monahan but i know it's gonna cost us more to do that mm -hmm. it was rumored in the summer that buffalo's ask was all futures how much of that do you think may have changed with their start this year do you think maybe they're looking for a guy like monahan who's a little older but 
is a roster player? That's entirely possible. My whole my whole worry about this is what if the surgery doesn't work? No NHLers had this surgery. Like, are we? Well, I, I'm a little less reticent about that because uh, that Ultimate Fighter guy uh, Poirier, I can't remember his first name. He had, I think, Dustin Poirier. Uh, he had that same exact surgery, and he hasn't skipped a beat in his career. And I figure, like, if you're getting punched and kicked in the face, I think you're next good. <laughs> you know, uh, something Dr. Does... Matt says, if you're punched yeah. and kicked in the face, it's good enough for Eichel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, I think you're good at that point. <laughs> That's going to be part of the rehab. He's going to come back and some <laughs> trainer's going to punch him in the face and go, well, he's good, coach. Yep. He didn't break his neck there. Yep. Good to go. <laughs> the, the disc held up. Yep. Um, oh, he's got a concussion. But I mean, that's, and I guess that's the question you have to ask, right? Is $10 million over five years is a lot of money to invest. But at the same time, I would argue that when Eichel's healthy, he's a top 10 center in the league. And when are you ever going to be able to acquire a top 10 center uh, well, for this I, kind of price? Not only that, I, I actually consider Jack Eichel one of the top five players in the league. So, you know, it's one of those that, you know, like he's had basically zero help in Buffalo his entire career. So, you know, if you put like an actual guy who can play at his level with Gaudreau on his line, like you're going to see his numbers go through the roof mm -hmm. just because, you know, it's a little different than Max Reinhardt <laughs> or Sam Reinhardt. And I think that also then maybe changes the conversation for guys like a Chuck and Goudreau, who maybe we're having some second thoughts about signing here. If you bring in Eichel, I think those guys want to stick around. Yeah, because, oh, this team might actually win a cup. So, yeah, I might want to be here. Yeah. Especially with Daryl being here. Like, you're, it, it, like, that's why, like, I'm even fine if the Flames even overpay over what the offer is that week said. Just because of the fact that, like this, you're basically saying to the league with getting Daryl, getting Eichel, that, hey, we're going for a Stanley Cup here. And, you know, you want to win, come join our team. To every free agent and every player across the league. And, you know, all of a sudden Calgary becomes a top tier destination because of the fact that, hey, they actually have a pretty damn good team and a, a guy like Eichel coming into the lineup. And, like, that makes a huge difference. Then I mean, he really becomes our first bona fide number one center since, what, Neuendijk? Easily. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're right. I mean, that says Calgary's going for this. You want to be here and part of this. And, yeah, I, I think it's a huge way to get our guys to sign, maybe even take a bit of a hometown discount for Goudreau and Kachuk and bring other free agents in, which it feels like maybe we've had some trouble attracting the last couple of years. Yeah. And the fact that you had to trade your way into Nikita Zadorov tells me maybe we're having trouble attracting some free agents. And, well, how would you say? I actually... Even though like he's struggled a bit at times, I still like that trade just because of the fact that the Flames really do need six foot five guys that are not afraid to punch people in the face. So yeah, I just know. when I look at the free agent crop, there was a lot of those type of guys out there. It felt like yeah, uh, yeah, and we got good Branson, so you know when you get one, you might as well get two and have extra fun. <laughs> Sounds like you're a Pokemon trainer. Got to catch them all. Yeah. And so that way you can just, oh, well, here, have all our fighting type guys. There you go. <laughs> that's that's where we're going to start labeling them fighting type guys to the ice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Take on the skating type guys. Yes, yeah, And the stick handling type guys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, like, yeah, I don't know. To me, if they... It, if they trade Kachuk and it comes out later that Kachuk would have re-signed, that seems like poor asset management. Yeah. I think you have to almost do the deal with Monaghan and something else or don't do the deal at that point um, because I think that the, the best scenario is a Goudreau, um, Eichel, Kachuk line. And without Kachuk, like we said, there's still a hole. And I don't know you're going to have the money at that point to fill that hole in the offseason. Well, and that that's where you begin to wonder um, exactly what ceiling Andrew Mangiapane has. Uh, and, you know, like, if you do deal Kachuk, um, is Eat Bread 
an actual like 30 40 goal guy in like a similar mold as Jake Gensel with Pittsburgh and you know maybe you try that out and see you know give him some rope to see how he fares and you know because like he's done a very impressive job thus far this season you know some added rope might not be a bad thing and you know just because he was drafted in the sixth round doesn't necessarily mean anything like it he could be a star player. You know, we don't know. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's one of those that I think that... Like, if the Flames deal uh, Kachuk in this trade, I think that basically, like, as you go through the season, I think that the Flames would then try to rent a middle six winger. You have to. Yeah. And it would it wouldn't have to be like yesteryear's Thomas Vanek trade type guy, like just a filler guy who kind of knows how to play offense on the wing that you can just plug in there and you know oh you burned a second round pick for him oh well who cares because he's just providing that secondary depth that you need. But at the same time, the second rounder feels to me like it hurts more if we also give up our first rounder for no, I know for Eichel. I know, and uh, it's one of those that... Like, I don't think it, it we have does... a third or a fourth this year, so you would not be picking till round five. And at that rate, um, do I really care? Not really. Uh, well, you you got to restock some of these guys you're giving up. I, I know, and that's where you, you say, well, hey, we have a foundation of our history where, you know, if we sign you, you play in the NHL and you can go back all the names that have gotten contracts and played in the NHL, and we're kicking everybody's butt. So, you know, you want to join a successful organization, European free agents and, you know, college guys, step right in. So, you know, it's one of those things that if they were to shed, like, all these draft picks for this particular draft, it also helps that this particular draft is not like the top end with Shane Wright is great, but it's kind of wishy washy, uh, an average ish draft. Like if you're gonna go all in and like basically, like if you're doing all this stuff, you're going to try to win the Stanley Cup. And if you have Daryl on as your coach, you're definitely that. Like that's the modus operandi is we're gonna be trying to win now, right now. We want the cup. And, you know, at that rate, do you really care long-term about a second when you can actually, through free agents and such, recoup that level of asset? You know, like, our prospect pool's pretty good as it is, and even if it gets thinned out in these trades, like, we still have a lot. It almost feels like if they... Trade Kachuk, either Backlund or Monahan's gonna have to go in the offseason just to free up some cash. Or uh Lucic. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, like and like if you say you uh, are able to trade Lucic to any team and not sign Zadorov, like there's like nearly ten million dollars right there. So like that's you know, and like you could just bring up Connor Mackey at that point and put him in Zadorov's spot as the number five guy, and problem solved. So, you know, and like it, it's doable without even like losing like a guy like a Backlund or a Monahan or Eichel or any of the key parts. So Brian Lawton on the NHL Network had a proposed trade that I think is too good to be true for the fr- for the Flames, and he said he's proposing Sean Monahan, Connor Zari, Jeremy Poirier, a first and a second for Eichel. Yeah, and I'd be okay with that. I mean, I think like you said, we don't have a lot of futures, and we need to make a run now, but we also need to have enough guys for the future. And I think Z- Zari and Poirier, the first and the second, gives us. I mean, for our let's call him our third line center right now in Monahan, still keeps a lot of our our top six intact, and is is going to set us up for years down the road if we can get Goudreau and Kachuk signed. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things that, uh, like, until like if this trade actually goes down, until we actually see the parts, 
you know, like, frankly, like, even if it, it was, say, Kachuk, Valimaki, a first-round pick, and two decent prospects, I, I'd be fine with that. <laughs> you know, well, and so that brings up an interesting piece as well, is, is there anything else you want from Buffalo? Well, and I'm sure that the Flames would probably want certain things back as well, like, you know, backfill a couple of things. Like, they might even get one of the those uh, winger guys if they have a spare. Well, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at who are their wingers right now and, you know, who might you take back. And I don't know that there's anyone here that I'd want long term. But, I mean, I'm looking at like a – and i got to look at these contracts. But Vinny Hinestroza might be a good fill-in guy. Yeah. Um, let me take a look at, at the contracts on these guys. Like, I think that's – Ultimately, maybe that's what the holdup is, is maybe Calgary saying, hey, if we do this and we do it for uh, Kachuk, we need to bring a, a, you know, a player back besides Eichel to fill some of that hole. And maybe that's what the negotiations over. Yeah. Um, um, I'm just looking. I'm just looking here at the wingers. Jeff Skinner, I don't want to touch. I don't want nine million there. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't afford. I, th- I, I think there'd be some well he's got 2 years left but i think that you don't want to bring Ocposo over cuz he's got 6 million you're trying to bring in cheap yeah um tag thompson i mean is he any better than what we've got vinny henestroza one vinny henestroza million yeah like i think those are kind of your options is thompson or henestroza yeah um even like cody eakins not too bad um yeah, like. There's... But I mean, the Eakin the Eakin deal is two point five, and if you're trying to save money, which I think at that point we're going to be under a cap crunch, I think you got to bring in the cheapest guys you can. True. I mean, you're not getting wrist aligning. You're, you know, John Hayden. I don't want. So I mean, when you look at kind of the the wingers that are on a one year, because the Flames are going to want to bring in more long term money on that. Yeah. Like um, yeah, like that. That's not a nice list of. <laughs> anything really um yeah no like there's not really a ton of anything the on only the other possible guy maybe if you're just looking for sort of a, a winger body in your top six would be drake kegulia yeah and even then he's less than a million but is he better than what you got probably not so i, I yeah i think you've almost i it feels like, like you've honestly almost... like uh, the like what would be in my head, like a, an ideal swapping of things would be Lucic for Ocposo. But even then, it's not like you're not really changing out anything either. So, no. and, and, you know, I do like Lucic's leadership. So it's kind of like, yeah, Buffalo sucks. <laughs> well, and, and that's you why, I, like, and whether it's Monaghan or maybe if, you know, if they don't trade Valimaki, like, it almost feels like you need, if they're going to trade Kachuk, it almost feels like there has to be a follow-up trade. Like, let's say it's, I'm just looking at a team that's maybe looking to make some moves right now. Maybe you try to move, um, you know, Valimaki for a winger or something like that. It just feels like there has to be a follow-up trade then with somebody for a winger. Yeah. And Hinnestrosa wouldn't be a bad, I think that would be, pretty much like the only well i'm not even saying with buffalo but maybe yeah. you make a move with like philadelphia or somebody completely different just to get yeah you know a, a good enough winger you know it just it feels like there'd have to be another forward moved in if it's not monahan going out yeah it'll be interesting to see like it's there's just so much speculation and it it's it'll be interesting like the flames are like i'm just kind of hoping that the flames get this done and you know, because, like, frankly, like, Jack Eichel, to me, would pretty much be the best player that the organization has had since guys like Neuendijk, Flurry, Lanny, when he first got here. You know, like, that level of, like, excellence, frankly. So, when I was saying moving a guy for another winger, if you just need a body, I mean, and here's a name, um, move one of your defensemen for Jimmy... VC out of uh, New Jersey, just kind of a serviceable winger on a year contract. Yeah, yeah, like there are plenty of like that See, waiver wire pickup caliber, decent enough but not great. So you think that the Jack Eichel trade is worth the risk? 
Oh, 110%. Like, uh, frankly, like, how would you say? If the Flames, like, say Eichel's not good, and, like, the Flames gave up all that, and Eichel, it, like, is not the same player and is uh, basically Gary Lehman 2.0. Um, name I haven't heard in a while. Yeah, like say that happens, um, so the Flames enter a rebuild. Okay, at some point you have to shoot your shot, and you know, like a guy like Eichel doesn't get traded unless there's a whole crap ton of reasons why. And you know, like otherwise, like that guy's on your team basically for the vast majority of his career. So we're having the luck of this guy being available in the first place. Now, is the situation ideal? No, but... And even for all the packages we've talked about, I mean, if you think that Eichel is a top five player in the league, how often do you even get the chance to try and acquire that player? Yeah, and like the last time that anything like that happened was the Thornton trade, and... um you know, uh, San Jose pillaged the, the Bruins on that one. So, you know, and it's one of those, like, and even then, like, when that trade went down, uh, the Flames apparently had offered, like, Regeer and uh, Kobasu and that, and they just went with the other because uh, they like Marco Sturm better. So, yeah, anyhow. Uh, but the Flames were actually in on that trade as well, but you know, like any time, you know, especially because Calgary doesn't pick in the top three ever, because you know it's Calgary. Um, that, but isn't that a good thing, though? I mean, as much as as fans, we you know we want that exciting player. Isn't it good that our team has never been that bad? True. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things, though, that um, in order to get that upper tier caliber of player, though, you have to actually pay the piper when it comes and you know like Eichel like if you look at like his 1920 season like he had 78 points in 68 games like that over like 82 like that's well over 100 points and that's playing for Buffalo like you know like basically doing everything himself and you know Calgary like that would be huge like you're you're probably would see him jump up significantly from there um in terms of his numbers just by playing with guys like Adro and that so like to me it's a no-brainer it's a risk worth taking and even if Eichel comes back at 80 percent of who he was you're still getting a heck of a player yeah like basically like if he's 80 percent of what he is was um he is basically sean monahan without the recurring injury troubles and i mean if if he becomes your if he comes in he's your first line center which let's assume it's goudreau lindholm and um and eichel and then your second line you've got you know backland and whoever and you've still got a heck of a a, or i guess your second line then becomes lindholm because you have goudreau kachuk um, Eichel, Lindholm would be your second line center, and Backlund your third. You still got really good center depth. Oh yeah, for sure. And yeah, like it, the whole team is just like it basically ready. Let's go win the cup. Basically, is where yeah. the Flames would be. And, and it's not an old player. Like I would argue that it feels like Eichel hasn't even peaked yet. No, he just turned twenty five like last week. Yeah, you're getting. You're probably getting the best years of his career. Yeah, and, like, to me, it, it you know, it would be like acquiring uh, Jonathan Taves in, like, 2011. Like, there's not a team that would be like, oh, no, let's not do that. And you, know. <laughs> and you were asking earlier about, you know, the uh, the Mangiapane upside. I think the only good thing with moving to Chuck would be you get to see what mangiapane has got. That would finally give him the shot that he needs. Yeah, and, you know. To me, I think that he would actually take the ball and run with it, but you know, we'll see. And like, I, I'm I'm just hoping that the Flames for once actually complete the trade. And you know, like, how would you say with uh, Vegas having so many injury troubles right now? Like to me, 
that him going to Vegas doesn't make as much sense because no, but the, Vegas also feels more desperate because of their injury troubles to make something work. I know, but it doesn't make sense because like I could understand it more if Vegas, uh, like if Eichel was ready to go, but like it. Like, their whole team is basically out for, like, a month plus. Like, the good players on their team. They've lost, what, Alex Tuck, Max Pacioretty, Mark Stone, White Cloud, Jan Mark, Nolan Patrick, and William Carlson. Yeah, like, uh, that's a lot. And, like, they're going to basically be a bad team until those guys get back. And, you know, like, say, like, uh, half of those guys don't come back until the middle of December, like, the uh, Knights could be having a hard time even making the playoffs. Well, when at your that first point. line center is Brett Howden and your second line is Chandler Stevenson, you know you got some injury issues. Yeah. And I guess Matt, like you were saying, you wish the Flames finally complete something. How many deals like this over the years, though, have we heard the Flames try to do and didn't get it done? I think the last couple were trying to get Mark Andre Fleury and trying to get. Um, Nazem Kadri and uh, Ben Bishop almost, and you know <laughs> it almost feels like we're always the bridesmaid never the bride like are we going to get this done or are we just being used as a leverage piece to get Vegas to pay more yeah and I think that um, the difference between like this scenario and others frankly is that Calgary is both in a better position to compete while Eichel is getting better and is, uh, like, on par in terms of the types of things that they can throw at the Sabres that any of the other teams could. If we were on our, if we were on our usual losing streak at the beginning of the season, I think it would be easier to stomach, move somebody, and, and get Eichel in. But at the same time, I also feel like everything's working. Do we want to disrupt the chemistry? Yeah. If Eichel comes in when he's healthy, does he get the C? Probably. That's the way you'd go with it? Probably. Can't wear number nine. If he's traded for Kachuk, you said to me earlier you think he gets 19. If he's not traded for Kachuk... Well, then, to... then what you do is you tell him, we only have one number for you, number 97. <laughs> Just to piss off. Well, didn't David. he wear 15 when he started in Buffalo? Yeah, but, you know, because they're from the same draft and all that, just to piss off McDavid, I think you got to, you know, say, we only have one number for you. Have fun. <laughs> I think he'd probably, the, yeah, I don't see him wearing 97, though. We've never, we, I can't even think of anyone we've had that's gone anywhere near that high besides Nylander. Uh, Camilleri did. Uh, Bennett oh, that's did, right. I think. Yeah. I think he'd probably go to 15, or isn't his Twitter Jack Eichel 11? So he's not going to get that number from uh, back. So, yeah, probably he'd go with uh, 15. Yeah. It'd be amusing anyway. Just, uh, you know, we'll see. You know, that's, uh, a, you know, a conversation for, you know, if this actually happens. All of a sudden, there's going to be a number nine jersey sitting in a stall, and they're going to say, where'd that come from? If anybody asks you, tell them Lanny sent it. Oh, God. <laughs> Not that commercial. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think... Uh, I don't get the sense Calgary's going to get this done. I feel like if it was going to get done with Calgary, it would have been done. Calgary's been talking about this all summer. And you and I even talked about this when we looked at this roster at the beginning of the year. It feels like... Calgary was waiting to get this done. Like, when we talk about this roster, it feels like Eichel was the missing piece, and they didn't get other stuff done because they are waiting on Eichel. Yeah, and how would you say, I think that um, Calgary, I think, is kind of like trying to pay as little for Eichel as possible, but I think that they still have the mandate of get the damn guy um, just because of the fact that... Um, age and stage with him as a player and you know the dynamic he adds to this organization i think that like if it's like he treleving is getting a phone call saying that oh well we're gonna be leaning more towards vegas's direction i think you you'll see the flames up their offer even more but i think you gotta be careful there too because i think it'd be easy to decimate this lineup to get eichel and then he's got no one to play with oh i wouldn't like 
take anything off the roster. It would be like, oh, here's an additional first round pick. You know, here's all of our Stockton players plus a first round pick. Yeah. Well, no. And like, honestly, like say, uh, like if it came down to it and like it required an additional first round pick and say next season, the flames are going to be good this year or next. So like, that's a late twenties pick, maybe 30, 32, you know, we'll see that, you know, like that's not as big of a deal as like a 10th or 15th overall pick. So, you know, it's more of like a old time second round pick at that point. So it's like the difference between you getting that guy versus not getting that guy. Do you go, you know, for a guy that's not likely going to play on your team anyway. (laughs) So the flames, I mean, don't have to, it's so weird because they have, they have to free up 10 million just to bring Eichel in to put him on the injury reserve. And then they'd essentially be able to get that money back. Yeah. So you almost wonder if you could do a deal with somebody to, I don't know, you can't trade a guy in and out in the same year. That's against the law in the NHL. We found that out with uh, Dean uh, Damon Lankow years ago. Uh, Dean McCammon, that was. Dean McCammon, that's right. Um, but it's like, I, I don't know, It's you almost wonder if they can do some sort of cap maneuvering of dump like Lucic on waivers, knowing nobody's going to pick up that contract just to free up $5 million for a couple days. Well, you'd only uh, free up nine hundred thousand. That's the. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's right. Because it's. I was going the other way. I thought, yeah, you only get charged the million, but no, you're right. You only free up the million. Yeah. So. So yeah, I mean it, and that's where they could get decimated too. Is trying to send money back, but you can't trade a guy who's on LTIR. Like otherwise, you just make Buffalo put him on LTIR. Yeah. I don't know, and, and maybe that's where the maybe that's where some of the maneuverings coming. It's like you know, can we not make the deal now? Even though Buffalo doesn't want him to get the next surgery, say we've got a deal in principle. You guys get him to do the surgery, put him on LTIR. We'll trade for him the day he's healthy. It, it's one of those that I I don't get the sense it's going to get done though, Matt. I, I have a feeling that my my strong feeling right now, some team that we don't think is in on it swoops in the last minute and offers more than they should. Yeah. I feel like there's a team that is someone like a Vancouver who thinks they're in, but isn't, who's going to swoop in, offer King's ransom. Now they've got one of the best players in the league and nobody else. Yeah. That's my feeling right now. Yeah. Could very well be. Um, and I think that Eichel, like, I, yeah, I don't think he'd be thrilled with that situation, but yeah. Uh, no, and like that's where I think that just due to like where the teams are at uh, and like all of that, that Calgary does have a little bit more of the the benefit of the doubt overall. But of the two, I would agree with you. But I think that there's other teams. If Buffalo wants futures, there's other teams that could swoop in and offer better futures than Calgary. Oh yeah, like New York Rangers could, ease, or LA could just you know snap their fingers and oh okay. <laughs> or so, Ottawa, like the, like there are teams where like if they wanted to, yeah, sure. The he, Calgary he, Flames are in Buffalo the 18th of this month. If we do the deal, does it get done before then? I put this way, I think this deal will probably be done in the next 48 hours. You think before we play the Rangers, it's done? Yeah. Either to Calgary, or otherwise. Yeah, uh, like I, I, honestly, I think that uh, before we play Dallas, it'll be done. With the amount of noise that's being made about it now, it feels like it's got to be done. I was kind of refreshing all day today, expecting it to be done today. Yeah, same here. And And I'm still refreshing. I mean, it would be great if we could break the story in the show. And you know what's going to happen, Matt, as soon as we hang up tonight. Oh, definitely. Then, oh, well, the Flames have traded, and god damn it. And I'm going to have to talk to you again. (laughs) Uh, And that they'll just ruin both of our weeks. (laughs) Um, you know, like it's, yeah, it just, it feels like it's imminent. And the question is, where does he go? Like he's, he's moving. I I get the sense he's moving. It's just, does Calgary, is Calgary the suitor? And if the deal that we're talking about is what Calgary's offering, why isn't it done yet? Like that seems like the right deal to get it done. Yeah. Like that seems more than like what Colorado got for Duchesne. And, like, that being, like, the last example of anything in this general ballpark. And that's fair, yeah. 
you know, like, to me, that's a fair offer. Like, the it, how would you say? Like, I can understand why Buffalo is, like, I would like a little more than that. If it but, doesn't you know, get done in the next, like you said, 48 hours, my feeling is if it doesn't get done, it's going to go quiet for about two weeks, and then Buffalo is going to have to come crawling back and say, okay, we'll take the last deal. Like, I feel like it either gets done now or – yeah. It's off the table for maybe a month or two. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think that there's going to be that point where Calgary says, we're all in. This is as much as we can offer you. Take it or leave it. Buffalo says, no, we don't want it. Then they'll come back to Calgary and Calgary say, well, we don't want to give you that anymore. Now that you're crawling back to us, you'll have to take Valimaki off the deal or something like that. So it feels like, you know, we're going to go all in and it's either take it or leave it. And I can also see a point where, and that's why I mentioned the 18th, I could see this being... It's off the table until Adams and uh, Tre Living talk when they're in Buffalo, and we end up coming off our road trip with the deal done. Yeah. Um, but that's just that's the way it feels to me. It's either going to get done now, or I don't think we're going to go two weeks with this. You no. know, maybe it happens today, maybe it doesn't. It feels like it either gets done now, or it's not getting done in the immediate future. Yeah, and uh, well, like uh, also like Eichel himself has kind of floated the concept of filing a grievance against the Sabres themselves mm-hmm. for, you know, because he wants to play in the Olympics and, you know, which I don't blame him. And, no. like, his timeline for recovery, you know, would basically, like, if he gets the surgery, say, next week, he's ready to go for the Olympics. Well, and that's and- the other reason I think it has to be done immediately. Like, if we don't make this deal now, you don't get him back this season. Oh, Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, like, basically, if it's pretty much, like, it, it'll it be like a Kucherov situation, you know, where, like, ready for game one of the playoffs. So. But at the same time, we're not as deep as Tempo was. I don't know that we can go for that much longer without, you know, especially into the depth of the season, without those key pieces. Like, I kind of feel well, like... Well, need- then, it, like, honestly, then if, uh, like, say, Eichel is out for the rest of the regular season and you've got him on the LTIR, then just add $10 million uh, at the deadline. And then wait till game mm-hmm. one of the playoffs, and the, oh, Eichel's better, better, yay! <laughs> and, yeah, it almost it, it almost feels like if it's not done now, like you said, he'll probably file a grievance. I don't even know. Like I, I'd have to go read the CBA. Could he buy himself out, get the surgery done, and then go over to Russia to prove he can still do this? Possible. It'd be weird, and like he'd be giving up fifty million dollars. But yeah. but at the same time, if he can do it, he might be able to sign the same contract again. True. Like, sign a, you know, for the rest of the year in Russia, prove you're still the guy you were, then come back to Calgary next year, say, hey, you guys wanted me? 11 million. Yeah. You yep. know, like, I, I don't know what the legalities there would be, or even just buying himself out so he can get the surgery. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Or, and then become a free agent. Who knows? Yeah. We're in bizarro land, uh, you know. Like, the only other thing I could see happening is if he doesn't get traded by, let's say, Remembrance Day, a week from tomorrow, I can almost see this being shelved until the deadline when somebody takes a flyer on him for next season and says, you know, we think we're almost there. We'll give up something at the deadline to bring him in, get the surgery, and wait him out the offseason. And maybe yeah. that's a team then like Calgary who says, we know at this point we're not going to get Kachuk back. So we're gonna invest in our future. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Like, uh, like uh, you know, I, I'm just uh, hopeful that you know uh, we have something more to talk about in a couple of days and do an, a very short episode of Fireside Chat in, in the between now and next week. But you know, it it's gonna be interesting and. You know, Calgary, like, it depends on, like, how actually serious they are for winning the Cup. Like, like if they're satisfied with being basically this middling team, that's fine. But, you know, like... But I, I also think that there's other ways to go. I mean, it depends if you're looking at winning the Cup this year or not. We've said for a few years their roster's on the right trajectory. So, yeah, if you want to win this year, you might need Eichel. But I think there's other ways you can start moving upwards, especially with Daryl as the coach and what oh, we're for seeing sure. the team, that you don't need to make the Eichel deal to no. become a contender. 
Oh, no, no. It, it's just that, um... It, how would you say? Like, the Flames have kind of celebrated in a perpetual mediocrity. Where, like, they're not quite good enough, they're not quite bad enough, and they just kind of hover in that middle group. And, you know, like, the Flames need to break through at, at some point. Like, you know, like, in the 80s, like, they were kind of in the same rut where, like, they weren't as good as the Oilers, and, like, they just couldn't get going, but then they actually started laying down some foundational trades, like getting Gilmore and, you know, like, adding the parts that they needed, and were able to take that next step and become the favorite in, like, the year that they won, they won the President's Trophy, too, and they followed that up with winning the Cup, and, like, this team, like, since then has basically been in that middle zone and not really willing to do the extra step or two that's needed in order to kick you over the line. And, you know, like... I get what you're saying, but I also think that there's a mentality among Flames fans kind of make this deal at any cost. And I think that's dangerous as well. And I've seen a lot of people in Flames media, both fans and and uh you know media people kind of do what it, uh, give them whatever the nice man asks for and i think that we do have to be careful with what we're giving up here because i think it's easy to give up too much and then we push ourselves backwards true that that is true um it's just that you know it, it, how would you say it like you, you look at like the um Ramage and Wamsley deal, right? And, like, the Flames got a really good top four defenseman and a solid backup. Yeah, it cost Brett Hull. And, like, yeah, that was way too much. They also won the Cup, though. So, you no, know... I get what you're saying. You know, like, that, that... that's where, like, the, the line is so hard to delineate where it is because... You know, like, if you do spend too much, but yet you win, do you care? <laughs> you but, know, and, like, that's where it becomes, like, a gray you're area. If you win, to me, I don't, I mean, yes, it's nice to win, but you also don't want to win at once and then have to blow it up after that. Like, you need to look at winning it this year and still having enough guys to keep well, going next that, year. Well, and that, that's the thing. Like, if you look, like, a Droz 28, um... Monahan's twenty six, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Eichel's twenty five. Lindholm's twenty six, I think. Um, the three main defensemen, uh, Hannafin, Anderson, and Shillington, are all twenty four. Like that's a group that's poised to kick some ass for like five or six years, frankly. So, so, so let me ask you this: Do you trust her living? Oh yeah. If uh -oh. Tree comes out after this, let's say we find out he goes to Vegas and Tree says the price was too high. Is this going to be the one that we forever wonder? Should we have just paid whatever nice man asked? Or do we say, hey, Tree said it was too high? It would depend on what Vegas gave him. And, that's a good point. You know, if Vegas gave, like, frankly, like where you're going, what, that's it? Because how often does that, that happen to the deadline? Where you and I look and go, I would have given that. Yeah, like, if the reaction when you're seeing, like, oh, Vegas only gave that much for Eichel, then it'd be like, um, Tree, what the hell? <laughs> you know, like, you couldn't have beat that? Like, you know, and then it's like, yeah, like, really, what the hell are you doing at that point? That's a good point. You know, it, it's one of those where, you know, like, if Vegas, like, significantly overpays, and it's like, dude, you okay, know. Okay, <laughs> so let's put it that way. So let's say that that Vegas overpays, or let's even say that Vegas gets close to what we would call market value. Even and then, I'd be if it put it this way, it would take Vegas to ridiculously overpay, where I'd be like, and we couldn't do that. Interesting. So, yeah, like at this point, like especially because like the Flames have really, like, basically since New and I lacked a star center, like Monahan's been basically the closest guy since then and even then like there's significant gaps in monahan's game you know like it's important that you know like for this organization to be a credible 
contending caliber team, like you need to have certain fundamental components and like having a first line center it pretty much is like you can win a cup without a first line center like Washington did how'd you say Backstrom he's okay at he yeah like he's good but he's not like top tier in my mind um but you know what I mean like you need to have that guy in, in order to like you look at like all the cup winners like over the last 20 years and pretty much every single one of them has one of those guys and you know Calgary hasn't and you know if we actually want to be serious about you know you kind like how would you say if it's a ridiculous ridiculous amount like say they want Kachuk Monahan and stuff then go have fun <laughs> You know, in Vegas. <laughs> well, and, yeah, and at that point, I don't think Vegas would pay that price either, and that's where I just wait a little bit longer for the price to drop even more. Yeah, exactly. Especially yeah. if a grievance goes to the league. Yeah. And so, like, it's one of those where, yeah, like, it, it's tough until we know what the line is. <laughs> so. And I don't know if we ever will. I mean, at some point, you may just see, hey, Vegas was willing to offer this, we weren't willing to offer ours, and... We're out, and, and I just I don't know. I guess I'm I'm more hesitant on this than a lot of Flames fans and Flames media. I worry about the injury. I worry about the surgery. I worry about the return. Like I'm just I know it'd be great to have him here. I just worry about the cost of doing that, and if we're gonna get our return on the investment. Yeah. Well, we'll see. And I, like I, I want Calgary to like how would you say even with the like Eichel being from the same draft as McDavid you know like that competition there and that rivalry like uh, you know and especially with the Oilers and the Flames both being good at the moment you know like having that fight with the Oilers like I think that would be good for each organization and like you know just Revitalize. Well, if, that, if that happens, you have to wait until March 26th. That'll be the next time after the Olympics that we'll see McDavid. Yeah, so it'll be interesting. You know, like, like I would like the Flames to, for once, have like a super superstar. Like, Gaudreau has been amazing. Like, since Aginla left, really, like this team hasn't had the guy, and you know, Eichel is one of the very few in this league that is of that caliber so you know like if we have the opportunity like i would hate to be not only regretting not getting him but then seeing him in the division where like oh great now we gotta play him like four times every year and that's the real thing that worries me about vegas being the other rumored suitor if it was chicago or boston i mean yeah it's gonna hurt we don't have them but we don't really need to worry no about like it. say like the florida panthers wanted them and got them it'd be like okay pff, who cares because the likelihood like even if the flames made the finals it, the odds that they'd be playing the florida panthers specifically it, like even though florida would be really awesome is still relatively low just because upsets happen so you know what I mean? Like, it's one of those things where, but yet, if he's in the division, you have to play him in the playoffs pretty much every year. And, because Vegas is going to be in the playoffs if he's there, and they're going to be good because he's there, and you're going to have to face him because he's there. And, like, that also is a component of this, where, like, at that point, like, if the flames don't go to that extent then like we're not as as a group better than what vegas is with eichel what's the point and you made an interesting point earlier i mean kachuk is 28 like it does feel like the window to win with this core is closing yeah and like that's where it's like well then what are you even doing and you know then does it make more sense to tear down you know, because, like, if you're not going for it and you have a superstar team in your division that you're not going to be able to get through even if the stars align, then what's your point? 
and you know so like that's also part of it and it's like that's where like if the flames have to surrender an extra first round pick it's like yeah but then vegas doesn't get them as well and that to me the the little bit of a premium there kind of tilts that i'd rather overpay a little bit than you know basically you know the team is going to be in tough to do anything at that point well, I think that's enough Jack Eichel's talk. I yeah. think we just need to sit and wait about for what happens, and let's talk about the week that's coming and yeah. uh, and what we may actually see because Eichel's still uncertain. But I think you're right. If we're going to see the Eichel deal, it'll be before we talk next. But before we talk next, the Flames have three games all at home. Tomorrow night on Thursday, it's a 7 p.m. start against the Dallas Stars. Saturday, Hockey Night in Canada, where, of course, the late game, an 8 p.m. start against the New York Rangers. And then the team gets two days off before they take on the, I was going to say the dastardly San Jose Sharks, but they're not very dastardly this year, um, the San Jose Sharks. And Matt, you won the prediction game last week. Yay. A first in You got the first years. point of the year. <laughs> Maybe your only point this year. We'll see. Yeah, well, I didn't get one last year, so it's literally my first point in two years. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Just bad. Anyhow. Um, what, what do you think for this week? Uh, win, loss, win. So you think a win to Dallas, a loss to New York, and the beat the and Sharks. a win to San Jose. Yeah, I think because uh, the Flames uh, kicked the Rangers' butt five one last time uh, in New York. I think that the Rangers are going to want. A little bit of payback and so i'm expecting a better performance from them especially because they weren't all that bad even though it was a 5-1 final and so you know it's one of those where i think that the rangers will be extra motivated and dallas and san jose are not very good so like frankly they should beat them so my gut feeling this year or this week tells me we lose to dallas we lose to new york and we win to san jose yeah. I think that the Flames are going to have a bit of a rough patch this week. Do you play Vladar in any of these? Um, or do you wait for the back-to-back? I think you wait till Montreal. So you keep, you keep rolling like, uh, like If you're going to play Vladar, it would be against Dallas tomorrow. But I think because of the spacing of the schedule, I think you might as well just run with what you got. Yeah, I can see that. It, that would be like the only game that I could see Vladar playing would be the Dallas game because both New York and uh, San Jose are better teams than Dallas. So, yeah. Yeah, I can see Vladar play a couple times on the road trip, but I think, yeah, you probably play Markstrom uh, this whole rest of the homestand. Yeah, because like, you got to figure that like the first three games of the road trip, I would expect Vladar to actually play two, uh, Montreal and Ottawa. Montreal and Ottawa. Yeah, because they're both bad, and you know you might as well. Do you then pull Vladar in again against Buffalo? Quite possibly. When he faces Sean Monahan. Pretty much, yeah. Well, we'll we'll see what we'll see what happens this week. Lots of uh, interesting ideas and and things that might happen, and we may have a very different roster when we talk next week. Yeah, well, it's interesting, and at least, you know, the Flames are have put themselves in a position where, you know, we can actually have a serious conversation about acquiring a guy like Jack Eichel instead of, oh, that that big trade happened, and uh, in other news, the Flames are bad again. Or the Flames missed out on it. Or, I mean, we've heard these vague things in the past, like we're in on Taylor Hall for something, and... It feels like the first time that we have some concrete idea of what the Flames are in on. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Like, you know, it's nice that, like, the Flames are a finalist for such an important player. Now, hopefully it gets done and we walk away with the player and all the nice things. We'll find out, Matt. We'll find out next week. Yep. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.